Hi everyone and welcome to episode two of the Bird Photography Show. Hi guys. So Yan, I have to ask you, on one of your recent Instagram posts, I saw this incredible photo of this ridiculously beautiful Regent Parrot. And I'm just dying to ask you the story behind that shot. Where did you take it? How did you take it? Tell, tell us and tell the audience the story of that incredible photo. It was on a recent road trip. We went to the northwestern corner of Victoria to the Mallee area where there's a lot of open country with like some nice dead trees, a really beautiful area, quite dry as well. And there's these pretty rare Regent Parrots. Well, we were just not really getting anything that morning. And then we thought, oh, let's set up here next to these dead trees. So we set up, set in the blind. And we just seen some parrots coming in. And then one time the parrots came really close, almost landed on the perch where we wanted them to land. But then last minute they decided to do another loop. And then I saw the bird really banking right in front of me and like, oh my God, that would be like an epic shot. And then I was just hoping it would do it again. And I changed all my settings. I was I dialed in for like a perch bird. So I had lower ISO, lower shutter speed. So I changed all my settings. I still had my extender on because I didn't want to fiddle around too much in case they land on the perch. And then I saw the birds perched in a tree, maybe 30 meters away, kind of looking down to the area coming past. And then it actually did the exact same thing. And I just focused on the bird in the tree and when it started to take off, I kept tracking it with the eye autofocus on the R5 and it tracked it pretty well. And then it actually lost the bird. I'm like, oh no. But then I just kept trying to keep the bird in my viewfinder and just pressed the eye autofocus button again. And it actually recaptured it mid air right when it was flying past the perch, banking and then turning off again. In the combination of the R5 and me realizing that there might be a chance to get a pretty cool shot here if the bird just does the same round again, yielded me that image that you can see on the screen now. And yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. It's a pretty awesome bird. Yeah, I mean, it's a stunning shot, that's for sure. And you touched on some really interesting aspects of bird photography in, in what you were just telling, telling me and telling the audience. And one thing that you definitely um, touched on there, which I think is so important for becoming a good bird photographer is to recognize patterns in nature. If you see birds doing something, they will very, very often, they're creatures of habit and they will very often do it again. And so picking up on that and looking for patterns and then predicting what you think is gonna happen. If you, if it hadn't popped into your mind like, oh, let me go for a flight mm. shot, you would have still been in the settings for the bird on the perch and then, oh, it happened again. And you're sitting there like, <laughs> oh, I, I didn't get the shot. But it's so important. And this is one of those skills that's really hard to teach, but that, uh, that ability to always be looking around, paying attention to nature, watching for things that are happening, looking for patterns and predicting what's going to happen often leads to the best shots. And it certainly did in this For case. sure. I think that's a very good point. And I think you have to think like on the spot as well. It sounded like I had forever, but I probably had like 10 seconds to realize I want to take this flight shot. It's in the tree and it's going to fly over again. So it's not like you have half an hour to decide I want to get another shot. It's kind of popped into my mind, wow, that was an epic scene. And while it's still flying away, I'm changing all the settings and then it's just coming around again and you get the shots. Having the vision and kind of always thinking about what you're doing or what you could be doing in the field is quite important as well, I think. You mentioned some of the settings and some of the things that you did with this shot. So why don't we just get into it and go behind the shot, behind the lens, the whole <laughs> shebang. Well, as you said last time already, we're both using pretty much the exact same equipment. So I was also using a big heavy Gitzo tripod, Wimberley head, 600 millimeter version two Canon lens and then R5. And I was also using the 1.4 extender. So typically if I had planned to do a flight shot, I wouldn't be using the 1.4 extender because at least at those EF lenses, it does slow down the autofocus like considerably. So I was shooting at f8 because I had the 1.4 extender on. I changed my ISO to ISO 1250 and then I was shooting at a 3200th of a second. The key here for me was really the high shutter speed and then using the animal eye autofocus and relying on it. And if I had tried to keep a certain focus point on the bird, I would have probably failed. All I really tried to do was keep the bird in the viewfinder without really clipping anything. So trying to keep blue all around the bird. And I think that was really the key aspect here that I could rely on the eye autofocus to stay on the bird's head. 
and my all my energy went into not losing the bird in the viewfinder. Now, were you using um, mechanical shutter or electronic shutter for this? Now that was in the electronic shutter, 20 frames per second, and I was just firing away. <laughs> yeah, that is a huge perk of these newer mirrorless cameras is these huge frame rates. And I mean, there's even cameras coming up now like the R3 or the A1 already that have 30 frames per second. I mean, at some point it gets ridiculous. ridiculous. The amount of images you're taking becomes ridiculous, but in certain action situations, it would still be nice to have, but then you probably need to use like C-Raw in those action situations because otherwise you're just filling up the cards in no time. Now, speaking of that, Jan, we had a homework assignment. I did my homework. Did you do your homework? We were supposed to test, if you watched the first episode, we were supposed to test our buffers with, I was using C-Raw and a slower SD card and Jan has the fastest cards but is shooting still in normal raw mode. So Jan, did you do your homework? I actually didn't, but I brought my camera to do it in class quickly. So oh, that sounds like somebody who does their homework on their lunch break. <laughs> uh, I may have done that in the past. So I might as well just do it quickly. So I'll put the camera to high shutter speed and this is with the electronic shutter now. So you just have to imagine you're hearing a shutter sound and I'm just gonna go. Riveting footage of absolutely no sound that the camera makes. Okay, now I hit it. And so I managed to get 68 with the electronic shutter. So let me do that with the mechanical shutter now. You should hear some sound as well. So I was getting 98. I got with my inferior card with C-Raw 124 in mechanical and 104 in electronic. Let's see what you get in C-Raw with your fast card. So by shooting in C-Raw mode, Yan in his, with his fast card got twice as many frames. In electronic shutter mode, Yan achieved about 40 more shots than he did in his previous test in regular raw mode, but about the same number as I got with my inexpensive card. So basically, in summary, in mechanical shutter mode with C-RAW, you got almost double the amount. Yeah. But with the electronic shutter mode, because it's going so fast, regardless of the card, you kind of get like about 100 at yeah. best before you hit some kind of buffer. However, your faster card would certainly clear that buffer quicker and you'd be able to get another bigger burst faster. The moral of the story is by using C-RAW, even with a not as fast flash card, you actually extend your buffer. Well, it looks like I was lucky that I didn't actually buffer out when I tried to get that region parrot image. That's for sure. I mean, you nailed the shot, the camera performed perfectly, and all the new technology that's in these cameras just, just worked flawlessly in order to achieve this beautiful photo. So that's awesome. I think that people probably would like to see your final processed photo and to hear a little bit about how you processed the photo. And I want to know, because up until fairly recently, Yan, you were still fumbling around with DPP, which as we all know is not the best software. So Yan, tell me you're not still using DPP to process your photos. No, I've actually hung up my DPP boots. I didn't hate the program, I hated using it. The files I was getting out of it were decent. So I've still been using it at times if I have a really, really colorful bird with really vibrant colors because it sometimes just has still more details in the file than Camera Raw, for instance. But overall, when you and I discovered Pure Raw and how nicely it cleans up the files, it actually then enabled us to go back to our Camera Raw workflow that we both like because it just fast and convenient and gets us the quickest way into Photoshop. I think that's what you and I want. We don't really want a raw converter that's really extensive where we do a lot of editing. We want a quick workflow from our raw viewer into camera raw, do the conversion and then into Photoshop. And that's when we do most our editing. So pure raw has been really great for us in that regard that it just cleans up all the noise because that was the problem with camera raw was just adding so much noise for some reason in these r5 raw files it was almost unusable so with dxo pure raw we clean up the raw files then i go into camera raw and in camera raw i just use a color fidelity profile 
that gives me slightly better colors and from there I just go into Photoshop and then I just run through my normal workflow where I just add a lot of layers like levels, curves and typically I also like to select a background so I can treat the background and the bird individually. And the reason I like to treat the bird and the background differently is because sometimes I like to individually darken down the bird without like darkening the background. So if we look at the raw image now we can also see my final edited image now and this you can see in this image at least it doesn't look like I did too much. It was still probably like 10-15 layers that I did on the bird because there was a few tricky areas those really bright yellow patches on the wing they were very difficult to actually keep the detail in because first of all they're so bright but then they're also so saturated and if you have such a bright yellow saturated area it's often quite difficult to maintain detail in it so I played around with that a little bit and then in the end I saved my file as a PSD file with all the layers so I can still edit it in the future. Awesome. Well, I'm glad that you're not still relying on DPP because I was actually worried about your mental health if you were going to keep using that program. So as far as artificial intelligence goes when it comes to the world of post-processing, for me, the first time we saw some glimmer of this was when Photoshop introduced the Content Aware Fill tool. Flash forward a bit and then I think the next thing that I started to use personally was when I became aware of, of the Topaz software, Topaz Denoise and Topaz Sharpen especially. Uh, Denoise is the one that I use a lot more and I was finding that it was certainly doing a much better job at removing noise than I was capable of doing or that simply was possible in Photoshop. Just amazing sort of masking and finding edges even of like single yeah. hairs coming off of a bird's whiskers or anything. Just incredibly uh, beneficial product for helping with, especially with noise. But it did have some problems and, and everything. And now we've come across this issue with the raw files where Adobe is, as we've mentioned, not doing a good job and you just absolutely needed some workaround and then DxO Pure Raw comes into our lives and the artificial intelligence in that program is just so superior to what Adobe is doing when it comes to starting with the at least the raw file and having so much noise. So that's kind of the way I'm looking at things. I don't know, what do you think, Jan, about artificial intelligence and all these things? Well, to be fair, I was never the biggest fan of Topaz because I always found or I guess that's a problem with all artificial intelligence. It works really well at times and then it gets confused at other times. So what I found with Topaz often is that it would really denoise one area but then leave like a patch of noise somewhere or leave a little artifact here and there. So it always seemed a little bit random at times to me or like I couldn't fully rely on it I felt. Whereas now with the XL Pure Raw I feel like I can run my raw file through there and it just cleans it up really nice and smooth also throughout the whole image. There's no areas that are like more denoised than others, for instance. And so I think that's really good. The only downside of that is obviously Topaz. You could run on like a layer in Photoshop so you could then brush in just certain parts that you wanted denoised. Whereas with DxO Pura, you actually have to run your raw file through it. You create a new DNG file that you then load into Photoshop. So there's not many inputs that you can change. You're basically fully relying on that program. And one problem we both have discovered is that it downloads these modules where it then applies like a preset for certain cameras and lens combinations. And for me, I've turned that off because it doesn't really seem to work and it typically over sharpens the images. And it also often, if you use like a rarer lens combination, like an R5, 600 and 1.4 extender, it actually then thinks it's a different lens combination and then it probably applies even more sort of incorrect or over sharpening to it. So I've turned those modules off but ever since I've turned those modules off the files come out nice and no noise. A little bit soft but then when I go into camera raw I can actually apply a little bit of sharpening in camera raw and that seems to give me the best overall result. Is that the same for you? I put out a video on DxO a little while ago on my channel and one of the main things that people were saying was like, oh, it's over sharpening my photos. And when you use their modules, sometimes it's really good, but sometimes it's over sharpening and it was a bit inconsistent. And that's sort of the, the amazing thing about DxO, but also one of its weaknesses is that there's no settings. It's like 
put the image in, go, yeah. done. And most of the time, if you turn the modules off, it works really, really well. So what I've done is I've just made three presets in Adobe Camera Raw, low sharpening, medium sharpening, high sharpening. So let's say you've grabbed your raw files, you've run them through pure raw, you're in camera run now. Are you just using what's there in camera raw or do you still have to make some tweaks to actually make those files work? Because I know personally the profiles that Adobe gives us were still not satisfactory when it comes to the actual colors of the image. We've dealt with the noise now, but I'm still left with kind of dull colors. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, again, we found the same things. We're across the world from each other. We're, we're you know, not necessarily in cahoots here, but we've kind of found the same things. And this uh, colors, again, from Adobe were kind of lacking. But once again, there's a rather easy solution, which is in some Googling, I think both of us found, I think you found it first, this color yeah. fidelity profiles. And some just software person created this color fidelity uh, profiles that you can download for all kinds of cameras, which are designed to much more accurately give you a better starting point as far as colors. And I've mm. found that they work quite well. So for me, yes, it's image goes through DxO, comes into Adobe Camera Raw with the color fidelity programs, process it up as normal in Adobe Camera Raw, then spit it out into Photoshop and work with my workflow action that I described last time to process that photo up, polish it up, and then I'll do anything extra that might need to be done to the image on top of that and then save the file and that's that. So that's how I'm, that's kind of in a nutshell what I'm doing these days. Yeah, it's very similar to what I do. The only other thing that I do, you probably have a preset for that, but I <laughs> like to play around a little bit with the color modules in Camera Raw as well. I used to not touch these at all basically because the color seemed all right, but I found myself using it a lot more. For instance, the red just comes out as a funny orange sort of color in Camera Raw. So using the color fidelity standard profile has helped me for sure. But even then I still find the colors are not necessarily always there. So I then like to use like the hue slider, the luminance sliders to push the color a bit more to where I'll want it to be but with that I actually then manage to get the colors that I want without having to use DPP and you will be all for that I'm sure. <laughs> I've been working on a, a, a big book project on hummingbirds and I've been having to go back and reprocess some of my old photos for the the new book. It is absolutely amazing what you can pull out of these old files. I was going back to some literally like 40D or older pictures and running them through DxO and then doing my new workflow, including sometimes doing Topaz. And it is amazing the difference. Now, another thing that I wanna mention is sometimes where I really do actually like Topaz is now it has to do not so much work when it comes to the, to the uh, noise because DxO has already handled that. But sometimes Topaz can really save a slightly out of focus image. Take a look at this cinnamon teal photo. Here's the before. And now when I put it through Topaz and I let it run the um, AI clear function, it really helped to make this image look a lot sharper than it actually was. So I still think Topaz has a place in my workflow. I think there's obviously one thing we have to talk about and that's the drawbacks we already talked about the modules of dx or pure raw that don't really seem to work and there was a big update but they haven't worked on those modules at all so we were hoping they would add our cameras for instance but they didn't and then the other thing the elephant in the room is obviously now we have to pay a hundred dollars for dx or pure raw fifteen dollars for color fidelity and all just to be able to use photoshop the way we used it before so that's obviously a big drawback and something we weren't very excited about, but we both like our workflow in Photoshop and we really cherish what Photoshop brings for us in the editing process. And we also have your eBooks down there in the description where you show your process and my masterclass where I show my process. So if you want to learn more about exactly how we edit our images step-by-step, step, check these out. But neither Glenn, nor I really want to get off our workflow in Photoshop. So that's why we've been trying to find ways to still use 
ACR and then Photoshop. And that's also one of the reasons why we haven't really been playing around with programs like Capture One too much because we're all about efficiency. We want to kind of keep using our current workflow. So learning a completely new software that's quite involved is just something that we prefer not to do. And then it also adds such a tremendous extra cost to it again that it's the main reason at least why I haven't really looked into other softwares and prefer to buy Pure Raw that actually allowed me to then keep using the workflow that I'm really familiar with. Yeah, I mean, I think I think $100, while well, it's annoying to have to pay that, to be able to not have to learn a whole new program. And let's be honest, I had some comments too in one of my videos about, about Capture One. It is not an inexpensive program either. It's a monthly subscription just like Photoshop. So I was absolutely not interested in really even entertaining that option. DxO, it's not perfect, but it does a really good job. You pop your photos in, it spits them out. It's super fast. It's not really, I don't consider it extra work. It's just like a slight amount of computing time. No. And so for me, it's a, it's a great program and it's not a gimmick either. That's the thing. Like, I feel like there's like an era when like filters were just like almost like gimmicks. It's like, yeah, I can just do that in Photoshop. I don't need yeah. this. But now it's like, I cannot <laughs> do that in Photoshop. What it is bringing to the table, I cannot yes. do. It is not possible for anybody to do that. So we need the AI, we need the program to get the best possible final result. And that's why we both ended up buying it. We're not associated to DxO in any way or form either. We just, it really was the solution to our problem with the R5 workflow in combination with that color fidelity profile because now we can use our own workflow, we can use the fast workflow that we have been using and now it actually gives us the results that we want as well. I mean, well. at the end of the day, check out the program down in the description. There's a free trial and I think you know, totally unbiased opinion. I think that every photographer has something to benefit from using it, whether it's processing old files or contemporary files. Um, it's definitely worth checking out. But I think we've droned on long enough about AI. It's exciting times. Cameras are getting better. Processing is getting better. And who knows where the future is taking us. But we do know that there's lots of rumors about an exciting new camera coming from Canon. And maybe that's something that we should talk about in the next episode. I don't know what you think, Jan. I think that would be very interesting. And I think it'd be also interesting to see if there's any more rumors about a 7D mirrorless successor, for instance, because I think that's a camera that a lot of people would be interested in as well. There's been a few rumors coming up and I think that's definitely something worth discussing. Well, there you have it. We got an idea for the next episode. So thank you guys so much for watching this episode. We really appreciate it. We totally appreciate you spreading the word about the bird photography show with all your bird loving friends. But once again, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Absolutely. Really appreciate the support. So make sure to leave us a comment, give us a thumbs up and we will see you very soon. Bye. See you next time. Look at you, nailed thumbs up on the first take. I've said it so many times in my life, I don't know why I couldn't.